It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. I first want to just acknowledge that today is uh, Persons Day, and back in 1927, the Famous Five began the, uh, the journey to making sure that uh, women uh, became identified as equal persons here, here. to men in our country. And on that note, I want to uh, direct my question, Speaker, to the uh, Acting Premier. Uh, does the Acting Premier believe that a woman fleeing domestic violence should be able to take a day off to get her kids to some counselling without fear of losing her job? Here, here. Acting Premier, Minister of Tourism. Thank you for the Minister question. Of Tourism. I am uh, going to take a leap of faith and assume that you are talking about a recent change to the roundtable. Um, I don't think that there is a member in this chamber who would ever suggest that workplace violence in our schools, in our classrooms, in our homes is appropriate. We all need to work together on this issue. It is nonpartisan, and we need to get past the throwing of, of knives back and forth and actually work together. And in, in the uh, supplementary, I'd like to highlight some of the important work that we have been doing on our side. Well, supplementary. Well, well uh, unfortunately, Speaker, the, um, the, the minister um, made the wrong leap. Um, we have, actually already have worked together to try to make a difference for women who are facing domestic violence. Uh, it's called changes to Bill 148 that are currently in place where a woman now is able to leave the workplace uh, in order to deal with the domestic violence that she's facing uh, to try to uh, help her uh, to uh, ensure that herself and her children are safe. And those protections are when men, one of the many many hard-earned rights that the Premier has pledged to tear up when he strips the protections from Ontarians' Plan, uh, Employment Standards Act. So can the acting Premier explain how a woman taking time off work to protect her family is bad for our economy? Minister. Minister of Labour. Thank Labor. you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I appreciate the question from the Leader of the Opposition. I think all parties in the past have uh, brought forward motions, uh, uh, supported private members' bills, and had great discussions in the Legislature of what more we can do to protect women against violence uh, and to get to places that can help them leave those difficult situations. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition is referring to uh, Bill 148, and we have said that we are reviewing uh, Bill 148. We, I've had many, many meetings with a variety of stakeholders, including uh, associations that represent uh, uh, people that are fleeing from domestic violence, women's associations, shelters, etc. Um, and we will be um, bringing information soon this fall to the legislature on those discussions. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker. I just, I just want to say that most employers that I talk to want to see those protect protections remain in place. So it's not just a matter of all of those fantastic women's organizations that are supportive and, and, uh, and helping women uh, to uh, escape these kinds of situations, but most employers that I talk to want to see the, those particular protections remain in place. And the law is designed to make sure that every woman actually has that protection if she needs it, which is, which is what leads to the question. Which is what leads to, to one question: uh, Who is the government uh, asking, uh, or rather, who is asking the government? Uh, if there is anybody, we would like to know who is asking the government to take away the provisions in the Employment Standards Act that enable women to leave work uh, when they're fleeing domestic violence. Because what I'm hearing from the employer side is they're not interested in having that happen. Question. <laughs> Minister. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition is correct. I mean, I think collectively as a society, we've been able to shine more light on the fact that there's a large increase of women being affected by violence, and it should not be tolerated in any situation, in the home, in the workplace, or anywhere. And I myself, uh, when I was in opposition, have passed many bills to try to protect women. Uh, we continue to believe in that on this side of the House. As I said, um, 
I have met with a variety of stakeholders, individual people. All of our caucus colleagues have heard from uh, the people in their writings about the increasing in violence against women and the need to do more. So, Mr. Uh, to the Leader of the Opposition, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, we will have more to say on that in the days to come. Thank you. Next question. The opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, for the Acting Premier. The Financial Accountability Office revealed earlier this week that $500 million in cap-and-trade spending has actually not been cancelled, but the Ford government refused to reveal where the money is now going. Can the Acting Premier tell us why the government uh, won't share that information? The Acting Premier. Minister of the Environment. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, through you to the member, and, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, the FAO uh, report did make a number of things clear, uh, including, and I will speak to uh, the member's question, but it made clear principally that Ontarians were going to save $264 per family. It made clear that the estimates we'd made around the wind down of the credit market of $5 million of cost were accurate, and it made clear, shockingly to some, that uh, the total cost of a federal carbon tax would be close to $650 per family. Um, it also talked about the orderly wind down. Uh, it as we have uh, discussed, we will be winding down certain programs. Other programs, including transit and housing programs, will be continuing. These are the sorts of programs that were spoken about in our platform, the important transit uh, changes that are being made in the GTA and otherwise. So when the entire program is wrapped up, which will happen at the end of October, for example, when the Windows program Program, which is part of the orderly wind down has happened. Um, there will be further reporting on the details. But, Mr. Speaker, I think Fox. the important part of the FAO report was saying that the government was on track in terms of returning money to Ontarians yes. and on track in terms of winding down capital. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, you know, families have heard promises from governments before, and they've also seen governments refuse to be clear about the facts. That's right. What they heard from the Financial Accountability Office this week was they'll be paying more. The government is adding $3 billion to the debt. There's no climate plan and their own government is refusing to tell them where half a billion dollars is now going. So why is the government not being upfront, clear and transparent with the FAO and Ontario families? Here, here. Minister. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm not sure what, what plan or what, what, uh, what, the, uh, what the Leader of the Opposition was reading, but, but what was clear was that the government had been very specific. We had said we would have an orderly wind-down of the program. Yep. That is happening. We had said that there would be a $5 million charge for the wind-down of the credit market, a market that the Leader of the Opposition would have said would cost $4 billion. Mm -hmm. No doubt it would have cost $4 billion yeah. if the Leader of the Opposition had, uh, sure. had had the chance to make yeah. it cost that yeah, much. Goodness. They also said very clearly that $264 will be saved by families and that a Trudeau carbon tax will cost $650. And yes, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, as the programs are wound down, we will make sure that Ontarians, unlike the previous government, see where the money's gone and they see that cap-and-trade is gone and that carbon tax doesn't replace it. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, what the minister still refuses to do is what he refused to do or the government's refused to do uh, in terms of a, a query from the FAO, which is disclose where this half a billion dollars is now going. Families have heard promises from government before. And they've also seen governments scramble to hide the facts. They, they, what they heard from the FAO very clearly earlier this week is that they will be paying more. The government is adding $3 billion to the debt. There is no climate plan. And their own government is refusing to tell them where a half a billion dollars is going. Why is this government not being upfront and transparent with the FAO and Ontario families? Minister. Mr. Speaker, because, because the Leader of his Opposition has given me the chance, um, we are, of course, going to have a climate plan. We were clear in the campaign we'd have a climate plan. We were clear when we cancelled the failed climate plan we'd have a climate plan. We were clear when we introduced Bill 4 there'd be a climate plan, and now Ontarians can give us, inf give us contributions to that at Ontario.ca backslash climate change, where we're collecting information on the climate plan. But let's be clear. Uh, the NDP have not been at all at all transparent when it comes to their plans that's why you had a 7 billion dollar hole in your budget plan 
when, when, when we talk about three billion dollars less in revenue, that's three billion dollars less of government programs for you. That's three billion dollars in Ontario where we think the money should be spent. Fox. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. This is my final question uh, in this series, and it's to the Acting Premier. Uh, earlier this week, my colleague in this House, the member for Quetnung, rose to um, remark on the life of the late former Chief of Grassinero, Steve Fobis, uh, Fobister Sr. Uh, I would mind, wouldn't mind taking a moment to add to my, uh, my colleague's comments. Uh, I, I mourn his loss, and I, I give my deepest sympathies uh, to the community speaker as well. Uh, the Chief died due to complications, or the former Chief died due to complications from uh, Minamata disease mercury poisoning uh, that had been, he had been living with uh, for decades. Does the government acknowledge that former uh, Chief uh, Steve Fobuster Sr. suffered from the effects of mercury poisoning and that this is what contributed to his death? Acting Premier. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you. As I had risen in this place, uh, some days ago, Mr. Speaker, I had an opportunity to reflect on a person that I've known for almost two decades, uh, sitting across the uh, table from him in uh, my law office in, in Kenora. I had a chance to admire and respect a man whose legacy uh, is without comparison. From a small uh, northern community, he led the charge not just for issues for his communities, opportunities for Treaty 3, but also with respect to mercury contamination. Most recently, a week or so ago, uh, my friend, uh, uh, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, visited the community. He had an opportunity to reaffirm our commitment uh, to the work that needs to be done uh, on the English River uh, system, and I had been there prior to ensure that uh, beneficiaries from that pension uh, would be fully indexed and retroactive. We're doing that to honour uh, his uh, commitment and his legacy, Mr. Speaker, but also to hopefully close a dark chapter in Ontario's yeah, history. Yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, to the shame of successive governments, former Chief Fobister and the people of Grassy Narrows had to go across the ocean in order to get help and recognition for the mercury poisoning that they suffered from. Experts determined that 94 per cent of the population of Grassy Narrows suffered from and continue to suffer from the debilitating effects of exposure to mercury. Wow. And yet the majority of the community suffering from mercury disease still doesn't receive any compensation through the Mercury Disability Board, uh, a board, as, as we all know, that was set up for that very purpose. Will the government commit to updating the Mercury Disability Board so that all Grassy Narrows community members suffering from the effects of mercury exposure can receive the full and fair compensation yeah. that they so righteously deserve? Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I should also mention um, that we had an opportunity to spend some quality time with Chief John Pace from Wabsimung. All too often it gets lost uh, in the discussion that uh, members of that community were affected and, and of course, uh, comprise a, a critical mass of, of the uh, people on that, uh, uh, on that pension. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it was a significant uh, policy advancement to index those pensions for the people who had been recognized by medical experts uh, historically as having uh, been impacted by uh, the contamination. I know in visiting with the community and celebrating in traditional ceremony uh, that we uh, uh, had done the right thing, Mr. Speaker, to uh, update a 30-year-old uh, pension, uh, ensure that uh, it was done retroactively so that those folks could uh, in, uh, experience uh, an increase uh, to reflect historical uh, challenges with the pension uh, and moving forward uh, would have a, a fully indexed uh, a pension from the mercury contamination. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Rouge Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. 
We have been hearing a lot about fairness in our auto insurance system. The Liberals and NDP had talked a big game on auto insurance, but time and time again we see that that is followed, so followed up by no action. It's clear that in Liberal NDP system of failed stretch goals and auto insurance is broken. The private member bill introduced on Monday by the member from Milton would, if passed, move us forward in developing an auto insurance system that is fair and serves the needs of drivers across Ontario. Could the minister please explain the importance of this initiative and how our caucus is working to ensure that Ontarians can benefit from an auto insurance system that treats the people of Ontario Question. fairly? Yes. Mr. Finance. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, Scarborough Rouge Park for that question. Once again, I want to take a moment to congratulate the member from Milton on his initiative. <clears throat> his bill, Speaker, if passed, would end auto insurance discrimination by scrapping the outdated territory system and preventing auto insurance companies from discriminating by using someone's postal code or area code. And it does so in a responsible, practical matter, or manner. The rationale behind this bill is simple. A good driver in Brampton should pay the same similar rates as a good driver in Ottawa pays today. With this bill, if passed, there will be more consumer choice, Fun. fairness, and a local uh, a focus on personal responsibility. Speaker, I look forward to continuing to work with the member from Milton on this initiative. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. It's clear the member for Milton brought forward a thoughtful approach which looks at this issue from a province-wide lens and which, if passed, would ensure there would not be unintended consequences for drivers in other parts of the province. It does not appear the same can be said for the member for Brampton East. After taking some time to review the bill he put forward in the House, it seems clear that it would have the opposite effect. In fact, there appears to be major concerns that his bill would raise rates on Ontarians in other parts of GTA. So not true. Can the minister please elaborate on these concerns? Totally true. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and once again, thank you to the member for that question. As I said yesterday in this House, the NDP member from Brampton East wants the GTA to be considered a single geographic area when insurance companies set their rates. However, this will serve only to increase insurance costs across the entire GTA. In fact, the member's plan would cause rates to rise in many of his caucus colleagues' own ridings. On the other hand, our member from Milton got this right. He took the time to consult to listen, to develop a plan that will deliver real fairness to the system. If passed, all drivers across all Ontario will benefit from the thoughtful plan he put forward. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety. Speaker, as the Minister should know, the OPP's Economic Crime and Corruption Unit has been conducting an investigation concerning a waterfront cottage owned by Vaughan Council candidate Eliana DiBiazzi. The OPP are investigating links between work done on this cottage by contractors and over $150 million in contracts granted by Mrs. DiBiase's husband to those same contractors. Speaker, the Minister of Community Safety is responsible for the OPP, and he knows that his office should be above and beyond reproach, yet he's been actively campaigning for Mrs. DiBiase throughout this municipal election. Speaker, why does the minister responsible for the OPP think that it's appropriate to be campaigning for a candidate that is currently at the centre of an OPP investigation. Oh. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to make it clear that 
I am here as uh, a member of the legislature, and this morning I did send a letter to the individual in question, as it's been brought to my attention that she has been using my photo on her campaign brochure. As a recently elected member of parliament, I understand that emotions and activity levels run high in the heat of a campaign, and that at times an overenthusiastic volunteer might take steps which are inappropriate or unapproved by some of the individuals involved. I understand that this may be the case in this instance, but be that as it may, I've, I've stated publicly on several occasions that it is not my intent to endorse any single candidate during the municipal election. I do, however, commend every Response. candidate who has chosen to put their name forwards on a ballot and run in a democratic process to work for the people. Supplementary. Restart the clock. Supplementary. I believe that the minister has just acknowledged a disturbing pattern that we've seen uh, by the members of the Crown on the other side. First, we have a Premier who's been seen campaigning for neo-Nazi sympathizers. Now we have a minister responsible for the OPP campaigning for— House will come to order. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. The government benches will come to order. Government benches will come to order. I'm going to caution the member for Essex on the use of intemperate language. I, I will recognize him to, to put his question. Sir. Speaker, again, I've spoken to the disturbing pattern that we've seen and the conflict, the potential conflict of interest on the offices of the ministers and the premier himself. My question is simply, how can the minister think that it's appropriate for him to and responsible for him uh, to be campaigning for a candidate that's at the center of an OPP investigation? Minister. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, I commend every candidate who has put forward their names on a ballot to stand up and ask the citizens of municipalities across the province to give them a chance to serve as an elected representative. For those who are successfully elected, it will mean years of difficult, important work and be done, to be done on behalf of deserving, hardworking citizens. I myself benefited by growing up in a community, in a province, and a nation served by politicians of fortitude and integrity. The society these great men and women helped build provided me and my family and millions of other people a safe and prosperous place to grow and learn and work and raise a family of their Response. own. While I cannot predict the future, it is my strong hope that each of the candidates who are successful in the upcoming municipal elections will want to work collectively to do the best for the province and for their municipalities. Stop the clock. Order. Order. Member for Essex, come to order. Start the clock. The next question, Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question today is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Regularly, like many of my colleagues, our constituents contact our office with concerns regarding the cap and trade carbon tax. And they struggle to understand how it is improving the environment, and they're uncertain as to the cost that they will eventually have to bear. But there are several, several things that they are quite aware of. They are familiar with the difficulty in putting food on the table or paying one's hydro bill, and surely not too hard to figure out their concern if they have enough gas to make it home from work or work from home. And they feel the burden that the cap and trade carbon tax has placed on them. Mr. Speaker, the people, they need to know 
We all need to know how will Ontarians be impacted should any kind of carbon tax ever be imposed on them. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Hastings, Lennis Addington, for the question. Um, all Ontarians do deserve to know what the costs of the cap and trade program would have been and the potential costs for the Trudeau carbon tax. And that was made clear by the, the FAO in his report. $312 a year, Mr. Speaker, would have been the cost by 2022 of the Liberal cap and trade program. That's one of the reasons that we got rid of it. But, but more concerning today is that $648, Mr. Speaker, by 2022 will be the cost of a Trudeau carbon tax. Oh, spoken of. Mr. Speaker, with respect to our visitor in the gallery, I'm not sure what they're smoking up in Ottawa, but this is not going to fly with Ontarians. This isn't a program that they want. This isn't a tax that they want. This isn't something that the people of Ontario or the people of Canada can afford. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, through you and back to the minister, and uh, I certainly am very, very pleased that our guest is here is here to hear our, our comment today. So thank you for helping us understand the impact of a carbon tax and what it'll have on Canadians. And as we all know, and I've stated before, most of us have experienced many, many Canadians are struggling with making ends meet during to the rising costs. I know my constituents are so, so pleased that they finally elected a government that truly understands and will listen to their concerns. Yet over and over again, at various levels, we see the Liberal Party, the NDP and the Green Party rise in this House in support, in support of a cap-and-trade tax, another tax. The FAO report concerns, it confirms our deepest concerns. The carbon tax will take money out of the pockets of every Canadian. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister Question. of Environment describe to us why this regressive cap-and-trade carbon tax program will not work for Ontarians? Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and I am going to take another opportunity because we, as I promised, are putting a plan forward that will work for Ontarians. So we're looking for their impact at Ontario.ca backslash climate change. But to the to the question, um, clearly what the Auditor General had said uh, when she talked about the, carb or the cap and trade as an ineffective tax, poorly conceived, that would ship hundreds of millions of dollars out of the country, cap and trade was not going to work. Uh, the question, I think, to the opposition party is a good one. The NDP member from Ottawa Centre uh, advocates a $150 a ton carbon tax. Let's put that into, into terms people can understand. That's a $0.35 cent a litre increase in gasoline. Whoa. Our elimination of cap and trade has already cut gas prices by almost five cents. We will cut it for five cents. We will cut it by a fervor five cents. But that that gas tax increase is forty one hundred dollars for the average. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop clock. Stop clock. Next question. Start the clock. Member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, we've just received some pretty shocking breaking news. Can the Acting Premier confirm that the Premier's former campaign tour director has been now appointed as the Ontario Trade Representative in Washington and will be getting an almost $75,000 pay hike over his predecessor, which would actually leave him earning more than Canada's current ambassador to the United States? Wow. Wow. Acting Premier. Minister of Economic Development and Trade. Minister of Economic thank Development. You, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the Honourable Member, for the question. Um, actually, uh, Ian Todd will be appointed uh, October 22nd uh, to be our trade representative in Washington and a special additional role that the previous representative in Washington didn't have as a special advisor to the Premier. His compensation will be very comparable to what Monique Smith, the previous uh, representative, was making. Order on the opposition Smith, benches. In addition, listen to this. In addition to Essex, her come to order. salary, was receiving pension contributions and a one-year severance. Yeah. Professor Essex, come to order. Not be receiving that. Here, here. 
Demographics, supplementary. Speaker, uh, apparently uh, the Ford gravy train has arrived at Queen's Park, and it's all aboard. It's all aboard if you've been a member. This is insane. Speaker, most Ontarians would be lucky to earn $75,000 $75, a year, never mind getting a $75,000 bump in pay. Media reports, Speaker, today indicate that Ian Todd, a former campaign advisor, is going to be representing Ontario and Washington, and that he'll be taking home more than the Canadian ambassador. How does this government justify handing a Conservative insider this job and paying him $75,000 more than the person he's replacing? The Liberal insider. Order. Order. The opposition benches will come to order. The opposition benches will come to order. Minister. Once again, we see NDP math. Can't you understand over there? He's getting a salary like Monique Smith did, but he's not getting a pension contributions or a one-year severance. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we fired the consultants and we fired the lawyers. The retainers are gone, and that office will be saving $710,000. Order on the government benches. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. To the Attorney General. A couple of weeks ago, the day after the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford at the Brett Kavanaugh U.S. Senate uh, confirmation hearing, two different women came into my constituency office and confided in me they had been sexually assaulted in the past. This disclosure happens often when there are, it's the essence of the Me Too movement, essentially, because disclosure triggers uh, memory. Now, I refer them to the Rape Crisis Center, and in the context of my conversation with the Rape Crisis Center after that, they explained to me that they had not receive confirmation of the funding from the Attorney General for the service of legal advice and accompaniment to, for survivors of sexual assault. Can the minister confirm to this House that she plans to continue to help survivors of sexual violence access the legal system? The Attorney General. Well, I thank, I thank the member opposite for the question, and I want to express the fact of my view and the view of this government uh, that we, uh, we feel for the women who came to you, and uh, we encourage all women who are, who are experiencing violence to come, and they, are, they were incredibly brave to come to you and tell you their stories. Um, our government believes that all Ontarians should live free from violence and the threat of violence. And that is why we take the programs that our ministries offer to keep uh, Ontarians free and to help them through the justice. We take the justice system, we take those, those programs very seriously, and we're looking at them because we want to make sure that they are delivering the services in an effective and efficient way so that they can actually provide the real help and services that the women need. And so I am committed to looking at all those programs across our government. We are all doing that. And we will have more to say on that in the future. Great question. <laughs> Supplementary. I, I think there's a certain urgency for them to get to know what yeah, the answer absolutely. is, and I, that was the point of my question. I just want to say as well, today is Persons Day in Canada. We celebrate the historic decision that decided that women were persons and therefore could be appointed to the Senate. Indeed, we celebrate this day because we celebrate the importance of ensuring a voice of women in politics but also in policy making. I understand that the minister wants to respond adequately to violence against women and to respond to policy gaps that exist. To empower women to be part of the policy process is really important in the context of violence against women. 
And because individual women that have experienced violence sometimes want privacy, governments in the past have often found it useful to seek the advice of organizations who work with women who are, have experienced violence. Question. So would the uh, Attorney General consider the advice of the Barbara Schliffer Clinic, the Calax, and all the, uh, the organizations that were part of the roundtable on violence against women, would she admit to having one roundtable for her ministry to ensure the, the presence of voice of survivors in policy making? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, and I'd like to thank the member opposite for giving voice to the women that giving a voice to the women who came to you to bring their concerns to this house. Um, I have had the opportunity to sit down directly with members of the Barbara Schleifer Clinic, as well as other members representing individual organizations that do the important work that we need them to do, and I continue to do that. And so I, uh, I, uh, I myself, and I know the minister, my my colleague, uh, has also, who's a minister responsible for women, has also been doing that. And I will continue to hold roundtables and also to meet with organizations individually so that I can speak to them about their concerns as well as learn directly from them about the important work that they do. The work that they do in our province is valuable, and we need to make sure that we are funding those organizations that are doing that work, but we do so in an effective and efficient way so that we help the women that are in need. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Burlington. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Yesterday, as a result of federal Liberal legislation, recreation cannabis became legal in the province of Ontario and across Canada. This coincided with the passage of our own government's legislation, Bill 36, which was the result of ex extensive consultation with municipalities, First Nations, police services and public health officials. I was pleased to see our government continues to make the safety of our children and youth a top priority speaker. There is no question that every decision our government makes with respect to cannabis must have the best interest of Ontario's children and youth top of mind. Minister, could you please tell the House how safety continues to be the top priority in our government's plan for cannabis legislation? Thank you, Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank, uh, thanks. I want to thank the member from Burlington for the question as well. Uh, it was our responsibility to develop a retail and distribution system that protects youth and combats the illegal market. Yesterday, the Ontario Cannabis Store retail website began to provide a safe, secure, and reliable outlet for consumers 19 and over to purchase cannabis, and I want to congratulate the hardworking men and women of the Ontario, Ontario Cannabis Store for producing for the people of Ontario. As cannabis is delivered to homes in Ontario, it will be incumbent upon those receiving those packages to provide valid ID, proving they are 19 years of age and or over, to complete the transaction and receive retail, or the cannabis. The Ontario Cannabis Store's online channel is the only legal place in the province to buy recreational cannabis. This will be followed Bonds. by a licensed private retail store in April of 2019, and we continue to foster a healthy competition to combat the illegal supplementary thank you, Speaker. thank you minister for answering my question it is clear that ontario has put in place a robust system for the liberal federal decision to legalize cannabis it is reassuring to see a system in place for cannabis legalization that prioritizes the safety of our communities and combats the illegal market. It's clear that this retail distribution system was designed to ensure that cannabis remains out of the hands of people under the age of 19. Although I am confident our approach will not tolerate anybody sharing, selling, or providing cannabis to anybody under the age of 19, I am concerned about players in the illegal market continuing to target our children and youth. Can the minister please inform the House about the resources our government is providing to combat the illegal market through enforcement Question. against those operating outside the legal regime? Thank you. Minister. Uh, thanks again to the member for that question. Once again, Speaker, OCS.ca is the only legal place to buy cannabis in the province of Ontario. Cannabis retail and dispensary stores operating in Ontario today are, do, are doing so illegally. 
The government has given the police the tools to shut down illegal cannabis store operators. Further, we'll, we'll be providing municipalities with $40 million over two years to help with increased cost due to the federal government's decision to legalize cannabis. As of yesterday, illegal operators face significant fines and they will never be granted a license to participate in the legal market. Since we began towards building a distribution model to comply with the federal government's decision, we have been abundantly clear that there will be zero tolerance for those who operate outside of the law on cannabis or attempt to market to our youth. Thank you. Next question. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Prior to the election, the Conservative promised to honour the gender-based violence plan that would have provided sexual assault centres across Ontario with a 33% funding increase. This much-needed funding would have enhanced services at existing centres and expanded programs to underserviced communities. Instead of supporting survivors, this government has broken its promise. Funding has not flowed, and this week we learn that the government has also dissolved Ontario's Provincial Roundtable on Violence Against Women, Shame. prompting the resignation of co-chairs Farah Khan and Pamela Cross. As a sexual assault survivor myself, I find this government's actions both heartless and cruel. Speaker, why aren't survivors of gender-based violence a priority for this government? Acting Premier. Chair of Tourism. Tourism, Culture and Sports. Thank you. Uh, look, as I said at the beginning of question period, there, there is no one in this chamber who understands and appreciates our role as legislators um, to protect women who have experienced violence in their homes, in their workplaces, in their schools, frankly, even in this chamber. Here, here. I, I want to I want to reassure the member opposite that we, we very much appreciate the work that the, uh, that the, the co-chairs have done. It is unfortunate that they chose to resign. I don't know if that was a political decision. I'm not going to go there. What I am going to say is our minister, our government is 100 percent committed to make sure that the women in this province who have been abused in the workplace, Order in their the homes, benches. in their schools, will get the help they need. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. In the midst of the Me Too movement, survivors are finally in a place where they can summon the courage to seek the supports that they need. The Hamilton Sexual Assault Center has seen a 100 per cent increase in the calls to their crisis line in the past three years. Their waitlist for counselling is seven months long. The funding that they were promised would have allowed them to hire a full-time counsellor to address their increased demand. Speaker, will this government honour the gender-based violence plan, release the funding that was already promised, and immediately reinstate the Provincial Roundtable on Ending Violence Against Women? Members, please take their seats. Minister. Thank you, Speaker. I know that my colleague is working hard on this issue. I know that as individual MPPs, we all hear from the shelters in our communities. Look, we know that it has changed. The system has changed. We have people coming to shelters who have far more challenging issues than 20, 25 years ago. We cannot keep up. 
operating the same way and expect That's that we right. are going to solve this problem. Right. I want to remind the member, Hamilton, even though she was order. not here, that it was actually St. my Catherine's colleague and order. friend, the now Minister of Labour, West, who order. initiated the Select Committee on oh, Sexual West, 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 West. We are actively engaged in this file, and as I want to reiterate, we will get it right, and it's not just about doing the same old thing and expecting Response. a different result. Yeah. Yeah. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General. Yesterday, recreational cannabis became legal in Canada. This was a policy implemented by the federal government, one that left the provinces and municipalities to, na to navigate. I know our government has been working diligently since being established to, since being elected to establish a plan to protect our children and combat the illegal market. And I was glad, like many others across this province, to see these efforts result in yesterday's passage of Bill 36. I know this bill was based on wide-ranging consultations that were undertaken across the province, and it makes me proud to be part of a government that works hard to embody the voice of the people. I also know we heard from many stakeholders during the committee process on this bill which also shared support for the government's efforts in this legislation. Mr. Speaker, I was wondering if the Attorney General can share Question. with the House some of the feedback we received about the government's plan to address legalization <coughs> and Bill 36. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I'd like to thank the member from Stormont, Dundas, and South Glengarry for the question. Over the past several months, our government has worked diligently with stakeholders across the province, including law enforcement, public health organizations, parents, municipalities, consumer groups, businesses, Indigenous organizations, and other provinces with private retail models. During our consultation process, we heard loud and clear. Any plan on recreational cannabis needed to achieve three objectives. Protect children, keep our roads and communities safe, and combat the illegal market. Well, Mr. Speaker, Bill 36 does just that. But don't take my word for it. In a submission to the Committee on Social Policy, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business said, and I quote, we are very encouraged by the overall direction that the government is taking on cannabis on Bill 36. Spons. The government has done a good job of highlighting the dangers of driving on, with, on and cannabis and the importance of keeping it out of the hands of young Ontarians, unquote. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Attorney General for the response. It's always welcome to hear the government's plan has widespread support and has been developed with a partnership with a wide range of industry experts and professionals. I know the people in my riding will also be happy to know that our government takes its responsibilities very seriously and is working hard to keep them, their families and their communities safe. Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General has spoken at length about the importance of combating the illegal market and the role that a private retail system will have in achieving that. We know that the previous Liberal government's plan to establish a government-run retail model for cannabis would not have been effective in protecting children and communities by combating the legal market. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if the Attorney General can share some of the feedback she received Question. on the change of direction by our new government. The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to share that information. We chose to move ahead with a tightly regulated private retail model because the public model that had been proposed by the previous Liberal government and championed by some Labour groups would be incapable of seriously competing That's with right. the illegal market. Under the previous model, our communities would have been left more vulnerable and susceptible to the underground market. Instead, a tightly regulated private retail model was the preferred and only responsible choice in Ontario. During committee, we heard from the Ontario Chamber of Commerce that, quote, the OCC supports Bill 36 and the Government of Ontario's commitment to developing a private retail model for the responsible sale of cannabis in licensed retailers, and that the safety and social responsibility must be the first overwhelming priorities taken into Response. account about the underground economy, health and safety. I'm pleased to say, Mr. Speaker, that Bill 36 achieves this for the people of Ontario. 
to. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of parent groups and school councils from every school board across the province have been waiting patiently for a response from the ministry about the status of their applications for the Parents Reaching Out grants. My office has been flooded with questions about what's going on. Yesterday, the minister stood here and admitted that this important parent engagement funding won't be coming at all. Will the minister explain to these parents why the government couldn't be bothered to inform them that this funding was never going to come? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, to the member opposite in the NDP party, she needs to get it right and go back and check Hansard. I did not say that. And furthermore, I think Ontario taxpayers will respect the fact that we're being responsible. After 15 years of mismanagement and absolute nonsense that was created by the past Liberal administration, Taxpayers in this province are supporting how we're going through a line-by-line -line audit to make sure we're getting the best result for the investment made. And so, as we hit the pause button to co consult from one quarter of this province to another, we are doing the right thing because we have to identify the priorities but from the people who are impacted, here, here. and we need to ensure that the consultation carries on and we fulfill every requirement that we've set out so that our voices are heard and we have the right priorities going forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, through you again to the Minister of Education, you've actually said nothing. You've said nothing to parents at all. The only thing you've communicated is through this house when we asked you. Mr. Speaker, parent and school councils have been blindsided by this government's sudden cut to this program, and they deserve to know why. One group, I'm going to give you some examples. One group was planning a series of three parenting workshops with a focus on well being, mental, physical, and sexual health, along with a lending library for parents. Another school had planned an event focused on STEM. They told me this school does not bring in a huge amount of funds from the community because our parents are living with lots of everyday life costs. We have very little money to use toward trying to improve our student experience. Will the minister explain to these parents why supporting parent engagement in education ranks so low on their priority list, and will you restore the funding now? It seems uh, an opportune time to remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Minister, response. Thank you very much, Speaker. And my number one priority is ensuring that every single voice across this province is heard yeah, in yeah. terms of identifying and having yeah, a yeah. chance to say what matters to them. We're listening to the people yeah, yeah. and we're moving forward for the parents specifically with our consultation. ForTheParents.ca is the place for people to exercise their voice because, you know what, the opposition, the NDP party, they're just trying to create chaos. And the fact of the matter is, I am so proud of my team in the Ministry of Education. They are doing an amazing job, Speaker. And we are hearing so much. The responses that we are getting from our written solution phase of the consultation is second to none. And, Speaker, once again, to hear from the parents across this province, go to ForTheParents.ca. Let your voice be Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Yeah. This week, the Select Committee on Financial Transparency began to hear from witnesses regarding the findings of the Independent Financial Commission Inquiry Report. The committee heard from the Auditor General and senior public servants about the previous Liberal government's accounting and financing schemes. These officials provided an overview of the decisions made and concerns raised about the Fair Hydro Plan and the details about the pension asset disagreement with the Auditor General. What we heard regarding the previous, previous government's treatment of Ontario's books continues to shock. Can the minister please share with this House his impressions of what the committee heard this week? 
Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Eglinton Lawrence for that question. We know that all members uh, of this House have been watching the work of the Select Committee with great interest as it begins to look into the findings of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry. The importance of this committee's work in restoring accountability and trust cannot be understated. It was alarming to learn from officials testifying before the committee that they repeatedly expressed worries about the Fair Hydro Plan to the previous government only to be ignored. Order. The Auditor General was equally scathing during her testimony, saying that she would have left her client wow. if they were private sector auditors. It's clear the previous government's rate mitigation plan was a questionable scheme right from the start. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer. Not only do we need to fix the financial problems we've inherited from the previous government, but we must also determine how the situation was ever allowed to get this bad. As the committee continues its work, I know we remain committed to ensuring that the people of Ontario receive answers. The Select Committee will continue its work next week as we continue to learn more about the Liberals' accounting schemes, how they came to be, and who made these decisions. Can the minister please outline the importance of the committee's work to get answers for the people of Ontario? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The com committee continues to hear from important witnesses who will help them get to the bottom of how this happened, Speaker, and why. We know that the advice of the Independent Financial Commission of Inquiry has been invaluable to our government. The Auditor General gave our government's public accounts their first clean bill of health in three years when the President of the Treasury Board tabled them last month. Our government will continue to work to fix the mess left behind by 15 years of Liberal waste, mismanagement and scandals and ensure that everything we do results in better government for the people. We appreciate the work of the Select Committee Spots. on Financial Transparency and look forward to their report back to this House with their findings. Next question, Member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Good morning. Minister, it's good to hear you talking about transparency. <laughs> Speaker, this government has been making secret backroom deals with owners and operators of the horse racing tracks across Ontario. They've been doing this without consulting the communities, the workers, or anyone else impacted by the deals. New Democrats have been asking in this House for the details, only to find out that government has required everyone everyone involved to sign non-disclosure agreements. Oh, so Speaker, so much for the public has a right to know what's happening to our racetracks. Wow. This government, so transparent. Why did this government demand a gag order <laughs> to be placed on the, on the details of their Question. secret deals that they've struck with those racing operators? Wow. wow. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Speaker. Our government has kept its commitment to bolster the horse racing industry and repair the damage done by the previous Liberal government, only made possible with the support of the NDP. Agreements in principle have now been reached to keep slots at Kawartha Downs and Ajax Downs and to providing additional funding to continue horse racing in Fort Erie and Dresden. The commitment will directly support the horse racing industry and rural communities. Our government has made a generous offer to these racetracks, including for the return of slots to Fort Erie and Dresden. But, Speaker, the, uh, both made a business decision to accept enhanced funding instead. Speaker, we continue to support this sector in supporting rural Ontario, and the members opposite would, be do, would do well to join us in that support. Supplementary, the member for Niagara Falls. I recognize you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. There is no clearer example of a backroom deal than the one that was made to keep the slots out of the 40 racetrack. 
I was at closing day at the Fort Erie track on Tuesday, and everywhere I went, the same question. Why would the Premier break his promise to this town to return the slots and the jobs that come with them? To be honest, Mr. Speaker, we don't have the answer to that question because the Premier never consulted the town of Fort Erie or the residents. So my question is this. My question is this. Will the Premier keep this government's promise to the town of Fort Erie and bring the meaningful number of slots to the racetrack as well as the jobs that come with them? Minister. I'm uh, very pleased to see that the uh, NDP member opposite finally recognizes the importance of horse racing industry, considering they supported the Liberals when they gutted the industry uh, uh, recently. So, uh, you know, the member may also want to take time to acknowledge the industry's Order. real needs. Yeah. We made a generous offer to return slots to Fort Erie. Order. But the owner, the racetrack, made a business Niagara decision Falls, to, to accept enhanced funding instead. We're committed to supporting the horse racing industry in Ontario, and we're listening to the needs of the industry stakeholders. And again, Speaker, the member opposite would be wise to listen as well. Here, here. Next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Local Government Week is a reminder that municipal government is where many civic-minded people have their first experience with politics. Whether it's casting a ballot, volunteering to knock on doors in their community, or running for office themselves, it's a great way to get politically engaged and to understand what public service is all about. Many in this chamber actually started their political careers either with local council or with a local school board. In fact, I myself had my first political experience campaigning for local representatives at the young age of 14. I'd like to ask the Minister of Municipal Affairs, as a former mayor yourself, can you explain how that experience played a key role in how you got to where you are today? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Speaker. Uh, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for Ottawa West Nepean for that excellent question. He, he's right. As a, as a young person, I was very uh, civic engaged, and I was very fortunate. It was a great honour for me at the age of 22 wow. in 1982 to be elected to represent the citizens of the city of Brockville as their mayor. And one thing, wow. and, thank and, and one thing that that experience taught me is that we as elected officials have to engage young people and encourage them to get involved Absolutely. in the local Great. government process. That's why, Speaker, Local Government Week is so important. It's a week that gives young people the opportunity to understand the importance of local government, to, uh, the, to instill the importance of voting, especially Response. in this yes. election year. And I, I firmly believe that by engaging young people, that they'll be the next generation of local schools school board trustees, local councillors, and local mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. That, thank you, Minister, for that answer. Your life of public service is certainly one that sets a fine example for any young person interested in getting involved in politics. Election Day is next Monday. October 22nd, and it's great that this year's Local Government Week falls so close to that election. We know that municipalities are the level of government that are most connected to Ontarians. It's those services like collecting waste and recycling and making sure that our streets are cleared of snow that really matter to people. In fact, during my own election in Ottawa West Nepean, the number one issue that I heard at the doors was potholes on local roads. Minister, what is your message to Ontarians as we approach Question. the next municipal election day this coming Monday? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Uh, and again, I want to thank the member for Ottawa West Nepean for encouraging young people to uh, get involved in the process. Candidates in the municipal election across this province are working hard 
to get out and meet voters in advance of Monday's election. And I think and I encourage everyone in this chamber to encourage uh, their constituents to get to know those candidates, get to uh, talk to them about their platforms, and most important, Speaker, encourage them to vote on October 22nd for the candidate of their choice. I think we're so fortunate. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate every one of those candidates that are putting their name on a ballot. I think we all have to agree that uh, we all recognize the incredible pressures that candidates have. So I think each and every one of us not Response. only should, should encourage their constituents to vote, but to thank those men and women who are putting their names on the ballot this, this October yeah, yeah. That concludes the time we have for question period today. Member for Scarborough Guildwood on a point of order. Border speaker, um, I wanted to just uh, extend a warm welcome to someone I respect for her work on uh, gender-based violence. Uh, Farrah Khan is in the House today, and I know today is the day of persons. I think it's very important that we recognize the work that you've done uh, for women. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Toronto Centre has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport concerning funding for sexual assault centres. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Sorry, Tuesday. Tuesday. I apologize. Tuesday at 6 p.m. I am now prepared to rule on the point of privilege that was raised yesterday. On Wednesday, October 17, 2018, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook, Mrs. Skelly, raised a question of privilege concerning an incident that allegedly took place on the floor of the House during the ringing of the division bells for the vote on the Opposition Day motion that was debated on the previous afternoon, October 16. The member alleges that during the ringing of the bells, the member for Hamilton Centre crossed the chamber floor to the government side and, while there, made deliberate and unwanted physical contact with her and made remarks that, the member contended, could be construed as an attempt to interfere with her right to vote. In response, the opposition House Leader pointed to an earlier provocation of the member for Hamilton Centre during the debate on her motion in the form of government members standing in the back row of the government side to block, allegedly intentionally, the camera view of her making her remarks. I've also received written submissions on this matter from the Government House Leader and the Official Opposition House Leader. After carefully reviewing the matter, I cannot find that a prima facie case of breach of privilege has been established. The authorities suggest that for a prima facie case of privilege to be made out, the circumstances giving rise to the alleged breach of privilege should have prevented the member from discharging their parliamentary duties. Joseph Maingott, at pages 222 and 223, of the second edition of Parliamentary Privilege in Canada makes the following remarks about the narrow confines of parliamentary privilege. End quote. There must be some act that improperly interferes with the member's rights. The interference, however, must not only obstruct the member in his capacity as a member, it must obstruct or allege to obstruct the member in his parliamentary work. For just as the member is protected for what he does during a proceeding in Parliament, so must the member's parliamentary work or work relating to a proceeding in Parliament be alleged to be improperly interfered with before the Speaker may find a prima facie case." End quote. The member for Flamborough-Glanbrook cited a ruling given by Speaker Peters on May 4, 2010, which I recall. But what distinguishes that incident from this one is that in 2010, it was established to the satisfaction of the Speaker that members of the Assembly were confined at a budget lockup in a government building and not permitted to leave in sufficient time to attend a meeting of the House. This obstruction constituted a prima facie breach of privilege. In the case at hand, the parliamentary proceeding in question was the vote on the October 16 Opposition Day motion, which I note the member subsequently participated in, casting her vote with the nays. There is nothing to suggest that the member was obstructed from voting or that the incident otherwise interfered with her ability to carry on her parliamentary duties. I understand that in some ways this place is adversarial, to say the least. 
That, in the innate, the very, that is the very nature, though, of parliamentary debate. Members will inevitably, inevitably have different opinions and approaches, and sometimes this will lead to conflict and heated exchanges. We see that from time to time. As I say, that is all fair and in the nature of this place. However, we all share the honour, having been elected to this Legislative Assembly, to represent the citizens of Ontario and our constituencies. It would be a disservice to this place and to those citizens who elected us for us to tolerate honourable disagreement degenerating to the level of personal insult, confrontation and closed-mindedness. Only very recently, the House adopted a member's code of conduct on harassment, which every single member of this Assembly has personally signed a, a written pledge to uphold. The preamble of the code cites its purpose as being, quote, to foster a culture in which members of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario treat each other with respect and professionalism, end quote. Hopefully, this is an attainable aspiration, and it reflects the ways that the, all members can expect the House to conduct itself when doing the people's business in this, the people's house. These are still relatively early days in this parliament, and together we have the opportunity to set the tone and establish a respectful, productive culture here. It is incumbent upon all of us to fulfill our roles with the dignity befitting this institution and to treat one another with respect and professionalism as our constituents would expect of all of us. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.